Bless the Lord Jesus. Praise God. I want to greet you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our soon coming King. I want to thank you tonight that you have come out, that you're online watching another Bible study session. You know, a lot of other persons are otherwise minded. Amen. But you found fit. Amen. To sit and to learn again from the word of God. I pray God tonight that whatever we cover in the topic that we are going to touch tonight, amen, that we will learn something from the word and that we will also grow uh, in what we have learned. As we get into the word, let me just bow, let us just bow our heads as I enter into a session of prayer. Great God, we thank you, Lord God, for tonight. We thank you, Lord God, for your love, your mercy, your loving kindness, which is better than life. We thank you, Lord God, that we are here one more time to speak the word of God. And I pray right now, God, that somebody, somebody who is watching this session will learn something and that will apply to their lives. Oh God, be in our midst tonight. Oh God, as we discuss things concerning your kingdom, God, as we break bread, I pray, God, that you will touch me, anoint me from the crown of my head to the very sole of my feet. Oh God, give me clarity of thought tonight. And I pray, God, that as we are about to get into your word, we come against everything that the enemy would want to try. I pray, God, that you'll help me, Lord Jesus, that this word will comfort, will power and authority, and that your word will speak into the lives of individuals, bring change in the lives of every person who hears this word. Oh God, help me right now, Lord Jesus. Search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. This is where we talk, shall a young man cleanse his ways but by taking heed to the word of God. So tonight I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come down and do a work as we look to you in the most exalted name, the only saving name, the name that demons tremble. At the name of Jesus, we pray tonight in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God bless you again. Welcome to another Bible study session. I greet you on behalf of, amen, our pastor. Bishop Garfield Daly, on behalf of all the elders and ministers, amen, we greet you in the most exalted name, the name of Jesus. Tonight, we will be looking at another important topic, amen, in relation to our Christian lives, in relation to us living for Jesus. Amen. Our aim in this life really is, amen, to know that one day, Amen. We are going to cross over. One day we are going to go to a better place, a place where God has prepared for us. As God said uh, to the prophet, amen, we look for a city whose builder and maker is God. Amen. We know that this life is just temporary. And therefore, as Christians, we are going to do everything possible so that we can make it in. But as we travel along this way, there are some things that are in our pathway there are some stuff that we want to stop us from making it in and tonight we're going to look at the fact that jesus himself amen did not just tell us to be overcomers amen he did not just instruct us to be overcomers but he became an overcomer so that we ourselves can become overcomers through him praise god tonight we're going to be looking at the subject and i'll be sharing my screen looking at the subject of Praise God. Lessons learned, amen, from the temptations in the wilderness. Lessons learned from the temptation in the wilderness. Praise God. And let me go ahead and share my screen and get right into that tonight. Lessons learned from the temptations in the wilderness. Praise God. Praise God. Now, I want us to understand that we live in a world where it is obvious that temptation and, and sin are ever present. There's, there's no two ways about that. Everywhere you go, amen, you go to work, you're at school, you're even at church, there, is, there are temptations and sin is ever present. These are the challenges that we face as children of God every turn in life. And the truth be told, it sometimes it feels overwhelming, amen. And sometimes we feel so powerless, sometimes in the face of these trials and in the face of these temptations, it seems as if, amen, uh, there is no hope for us. 
last week I, I looked at the, this, the whole subject of the consequences of sin. And we, we, we looked at six things, praise God, that challenges us as children of God. Amen. Six consequences that will come as a result of us. Amen. Committing sin. We talk about deception of sinful thinking. We talk about how sin will escalate. In other words, um, when you start something, it often leads you further than you originally intended to go. We talk about the impact that sin will have on others. Amen. So realize that when we commit sin, it doesn't only affect the individual committing the sin, but what it does exposes others to danger and to hurt and to disappointments. Amen. We look at the difficulty of repentance because the longer we indulge in sin, the harder it becomes to repent and to turn away from it. Amen. It, it, it somehow creates this barrier between us and God. And it's only through genuine repentance, amen, that, that, that we can actually get back that, 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 that bridge, amen, being formed, that, that, that connection, I should say, being formed between you and your creator. However, we realize that sin makes it increasingly challenging, amen, to break free sometimes of the grass. However, we also look at the permanence of consequences, meaning sometimes we, even if we are, are able Amen. To find a place of repentance and, and get forgiveness to the grace of God. Amen. We realize that the consequences of sin may still linger. Amen. And sometimes we are left with this lasting um, impression, this lasting thing, impact on our lives. Amen. Because of sin. We talk about the temporal blessings that we may lose because of sin. Some doors are... Uh, are closed uh, due to the, the, the past transgressions that we have. We talk about the, the, the long-term repercussions of sin. You know, all of these things we spoke about last week. And, you know, looking at the consequences, we, we, it seems as if that we are without hope or our, our resources, amen, in order to overcome these things. But tonight I'm here to tell us that Jesus, in his infinite wisdom and love, Brothers and sisters, he has provided us with the tools that we need to overcome every single temptation. Amen. Uh, you, you, temptation is not unique to any one individual. Every person will overcome, will get temptation. But not only that, Jesus has provided us with the wisdom and the love and the strength and everything we need. And he did this through his, his example. He never does tell us that we can overcome, but he overcame. Amen. So through his teaching and through his example and through his sacrifice, we are equipped, brothers and sisters, to stand strong against the forces that seek to lead us astray from God. Amen. And tonight I'm here to remind us of the powerful truths that with Jesus at our side, amen, we can become overcomers in every aspect of our lives. Amen. Um, so tonight, as I said before, the lesson is we're going to learn from the temptation that Jesus had in the wilderness. What are the lessons learned from the temptation in the wilderness? Tonight, we look at a few scriptures that will, uh, key verses that we'll use as our key text tonight. Firstly, we look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 2. Matthew chapter 4. And verse 1 to 2. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. So Jesus was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he was, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hung on. Another verse we're looking at tonight is Hebrews chapter 4, from verse 14 to 16. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest, 
which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Praise God. Last verse we look at is John 16, 33 as our key verse. And, and reading this one from the NIV, he says, I have told you these things so that in me ye may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, the King James, be, be, take heart, be comforted. I have overcome the world. Praise God. Now, as we look at the temptation of Jesus Christ, it's very important for us to understand that the record, the story about the temptation of Jesus Christ is recorded in Matthew chapter 4, from verse 1 to 11. It's also recorded in Mark chapter 1, from verse 12 to 13, and Luke chapter 4, from verse 1 to 13. So all the synoptic gospels actually recounted the story of Jesus's temptation. They describe the story of how Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted. Now, I want us to make note of some things as we look at the scripture, because it's very important that we realize that even though Jesus was tempted, the passage made it clear to us that it was the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, that is another term that is used in the KJV, but it's a, it's a term that is used in reference to the Holy Spirit as well. So the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness specifically to be tempted. And I and I, I thought about that and I'm saying, okay, so there are cases where the Spirit of God would lead you to be tempted. But how do I reconcile that with James, which says, when let no man say when he's tempted, that he's tempted of God, for God can tempt no man with evil. So I, 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 I thought about this. Are we going to try to address some of these things to show, firstly, that there are no contradictions in the scripture? Thirdly, we need to understand that the temptation of Jesus is a demonstration of how man should walk before God. What do I mean by that? I am saying then that one of the mistakes that we have when we read the account of Jesus Christ in the Gospels is that we get the impression that they were written to show us how God would behave if he were if he should come among men. We get the impression that we know as apostolics that Jesus is God manifest in flesh. We are fully aware of that. I mean, Paul writing to Timothy did say without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, for God was manifest in the flesh. He said to the church according to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. John spoke about it. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And God said the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten full of grace and truth. So we are fully aware that Jesus is God. But I strongly believe and I think that this when we see incidents like these, what God wanted to demonstrate to us is not how God should behave among men, but it's how men should walk before God. In other words, Jesus was demonstrating to us what it means like uh, to be, how man should have operated from the beginning. Amen. We realize that the first man failed and Jesus did not just come to be the God manifest in flesh, but he came to be the man, the example for us so that we can learn and realize that as a man, which he was, amen, which overcame the temptations and he did that, amen, so that we might realize that truly we can overcome temptations. In other words, if you are in Christ, praise God, then you can overcome temptation in this life. So the temptation of Jesus Christ is a demonstration of how man should walk before God. I mean, we talk about the consequence of sin, but I'm telling you now that God now demonstrates to us himself 
how we should walk before God. He did not just come and tell you that you should not do this or you should do that. Amen. He did not become a dictator. But what he did, he realized that the true power, amen, of what it takes to become a leader is truly influence. You practice what you say, amen. He realized that uh, what you say is very loud and therefore he demonstrated to us being the word. He did not just speak the word, but he lived the word, amen. Everything, praise God, as he said to the Pharisees, I am that I have said to you from the beginning. In other words, he was demonstrating to them that look here, you can as a man, amen, live the life that you speak. Amen. If you tell people that you are a Christian, praise God, you can show them what a Christian looks like. Amen. As a matter of fact, your life should speak before your very words. People should look at you and say, that person is a Christian. So the temptation of Jesus Christ is a demonstration of how man should walk before God. Lastly, I want us to take note of the fact that Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And when we go through scriptures, amen, even from Genesis all the way through to the Old Testament, we realize that the number 40 seemed to be very significant. Amen. 40 days and 40 nights is not the first time we hear this. We see 40 days and 40 nights, amen, where Noah was in the ark and it rained for that period of time. We see Moses as he went on to Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 24. Amen. He spent 40 days and he spent 40 nights on Mount Sinai before he received the Ten Commandments. And he, and he communed with God at that period of time. And it kind of spirit kind of represented or symbolized spiritual renewness. Amen. And, and building a covenant with God. 40 days. We see the Israelites sending spies to spy out Canaan and they spent 40 days over there. We see Elijah's journey to Mount Horeb and he spent 40 days in First Kings chapter 19. So the scripture was very clear to let us know that he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And, and I guess this also demonstrates to us some other pictures that Matthew wants us to know. Matthew wanted us to understand that Jesus spent this amount of time in the Judean wilderness and describe the physical uh, condition that Jesus would have been in after such a prolonged fast. So the Bible never leave out any of the messages. He want uh, any of the message. He wanted us to get the full picture. The Spirit of God led him into the wilderness. He was in there for 40 days and he was there for 40 nights. And we observe that after 40 days, when the Bible said hunger returned at a period of time, and the, and the Bible said he was hungered, it suggests to us, if you look at it in its in its origin language, it suggests to us that the person was not just barely hungry, like, like normal hungry, but was at a point where he was suffering, as it were, from starvation. That was how deep the hunger was, praise God. When the Bible said he hungered, amen, in its root, it actually speaks to the point that he was suffering to the point of starvation. It was terrible. It was not easy. Having been in the wilderness, for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And I want us to get this because these are the things that will form the basis for where we are going to go in understanding the lessons that we can learn from the temptation of Jesus Christ. Now, let us start by defining some words. So the word temptation, as used in the, the Bible, it comes from a Greek word, perizazo, a perizazo. P-E-I-R-A-Z-O, periazo. And it is used in the Bible in two distinct ways. So every time when the Bible uses the term temptation, it is one of two ways it is used. One, it is used as a means to entice one to do evil. So the Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 30, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot tempt with evil, neither tempt he any man. So the first use of the word for temptation means an enticement to do evil. It means you are lured into doing something wrong or sinful. Amen. And this is what James was talking about in James chapter 1 and verse 13. It's a lure, it's an enticement to do something that, that is definitely contrary to the word of God. However, the Bible also uses the term, the same word, but the context means it's used a different way. 
So it means to test or to try someone's character. So temptation can also mean the act of testing or trying someone to prove their character or their faith. It's, it's, it's almost like you taking, it's the same way like you would put, for example, a precious stone, like a gold or a diamond or something like that. You put it in the refiner's fire. And, 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 and what the, the temptation is supposed to do is meant to refine the person or to strengthen the person. Uh, so that's practically what temptation means. What are two things? To entice or to do evil, number one. Or it means to test you or to try someone's character. And the, the aim of that is to refine you or to strengthen you or to make you into the person that God wants you to be. Therefore, what we realize is that irrespective of the type of temptation, however, in Bible, if it's a devil trying to tempt you or it is a, it's, it's some, a temptation that comes to, to try you or to try your character or to, to make you to somebody better, amen, to purify you, to refine you, we realize that there are a few things that we can learn in relation to the temptation, especially for our Lord Jesus Christ. Number one. Let us try to, before we even break down the temptations, let us just look at a high level from what we can find from the verse. One, when we read through the scripture, we realize that temptation shows us that when the word of God controls our lives, we have power in ministry. In other words, you can only become powerful in your ministry, in what you do in the house of the Lord, when the word of God controls your life. When you're being controlled, when you're being Lord, when you're being, uh, when the word of God is what dictates your next move, praise God, amen, you realize that you will have power in ministry, amen. Here it is that Jesus was about to start his ministry. Uh, we know the, in, chapter, in Matthew chapter 1, 2, uh, 3, we realize that in those chapters, Praise God. For example, he was baptized. Um, in, in, in He was baptized of John. We know all of these things. And now at the end of all of that public thing where a dove came down on him and he was anointed for ministry. As he was about to go into ministry, now comes the test of who you are. And the only thing that would make him equipped, amen, and in the power or have the power for ministry would have been the word of God. Amen. And it had to be a case where the word of God was in total control of his life. Amen. It was the minister who said it on Sunday. Sometimes you talk about, amen, you have it. But the truth is that, it, it, does it have you? Amen. Talking about the Holy Ghost in that instant. But in a similar way, you can talk about, you know the word. But does the word of God have you to a point where it dictates where your next step is. Amen. Like, like the psalmist says in Psalm 119, I think it was 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Amen. Meaning every step that we take, amen, it's based on what the word of God says. So temptation shows us that when the word of God controls our lives, praise God, uh, we have power in ministry. Number two, I want us to realize that temptation does not come because you are a sinner. I mean, a lot of people get the impression, I mean, that the temptations come to you because you have sinned. That's not necessarily true. I mean, the temptation comes to you because you are a man and man can be tempted. That means that if you are a righteous man, if you are a sinner, it doesn't matter who you are, temptation will come. And, and it shows clearly from the, the scripture we read in Matthew chapter 4, because Jesus was obviously, a praise God, obviously uh, a righteous man. He was obviously a righteous man. Amen. A man that could not sin. But yet still we find out, praise God, that that temptation still came his way. So temptation will come because you are a man, irrespective of who you are. If you're a righteous man or you're a sinner, it doesn't matter. Both the righteous and the sinner is tempted. Number three that I noticed at a high level is that Jesus' temptation was in the wilderness. And I, and I, and I wonder this because Jesus came to be the second Adam. And note that in the first Adam, 
when temptation came in a similar form, it was in a garden. But with the second temptation, it took place in a place that was that was void of anything green. It was a wilderness. It was a deserty place. It was a dry place. Praise God. It and, and, and we're going to talk about this later on, but I note the contrast between the fact that one was tempted in a place of beauty, the other was tempted in a place of dryness. And, and, I, and I wondered to myself that I thought that temptation would only take people when they are in a certain place, you know? Um, they will they will tell you, like people who come from the country, don't come to Kingston, for example, because, you know, this one, this will happen. Or don't go to university, amen, because university will cause you to backslide. Or don't do this or don't do that. But I realize that God wanted to bring out this point to us that temptation will come irrespective of where you are. You could be in the garden or the very contrasting place. Praise God, the wilderness, amen temptation comes because the truth be told where temptation stems from is from the man that's what the bible says that amen uh that is not what comes into a man defile him but what comes out of the man praise god and therefore we have to check our hearts that is why if the word of god praise god control your lives then that is what is going to come out of your life praise god so jesus was tempted in the wilderness but the first adam was tempted in the garden Amen. And what made him victorious was not because of where he was, but because of what was on the inside of him. Praise God. I've, I've heard a story. I've read a story once with a missionary who was about to go somewhere and he was talking to a junior missionary, practically. I'll, I'll, I'll call it that way based on my remembrance of the story. Amen. And he was wondering, how do you control yourself? How do you ensure that at the end of the day, amen, you 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 are so controlled, you certain things don't come out, you know? People to hurt you and you don't end up cussing them out or things happen and you end up not, not dealing with them a particular way. And he had a cup of water on the table and the guy knocked the table hard to the point that the water splashed out of the cup. Amen. And he started to say to him that if there was... Do you think that, and I'm paraphrasing, that when I knocked this cup, something else could have come out apart from the water? And the gentleman was like, no. And said, the same thing happens. I mean, when we are shaken, when we are troubled, when we are, when we are in a situation, what will come out of us is what was inside of us. When, when the situations begin to rock us, when, when the temptation comes and the troubles comes, amen, it doesn't matter if you're in a wilderness or a garden. If what is inside of you is the word of God, then it's the word of God that's going to spill out. Amen. If what is inside of you was a corrupt and a bitter heart and a terrible heart, that is why you should not even be troubled sometimes when you see people behave a particular way, amen, because what it reflects is what was uh, what was, was planted on the inside, what was placed, the liquid that was thrown in the cup is what will come out when there's a shaking. So Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Adam was tempted in the garden. Praise God. But we realize that what was inside of Jesus was the word of God. And it helped. that's what came out at every point of the temptation. Brings to the point that where does temptation comes from? Where does temptation comes from? Now, the truth be told is that the Bible, as I said before, uh, gives us two definitions for temptation. Now, the first definition is where we're enticed to do evil. Uh, and when we're enticed to do evil, this temptation actually comes from one of three places. Either comes from the devil, or it comes from, praise God, it comes from uh, our own desire, our loss, our human nature, or it comes from the world. Now, there are a couple of verses that support this point to show us where these temptations come from. So for example, from the devil. Here it is that Peter is writing and he's saying that be sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion, walk it about seeking whom he may devour. And notice the term, first of all, it described, amen, the devil as a roaring lion. First of all, it says that we must be sober and be vigilant. Because our adversary, not our friend, amen, our enemy, the devil, 
as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. No, you never said he can devour. Well, you never said that he will devour because the truth be told, he's that there is a possibility, amen, that you can overcome him. When he came to Jesus in the wilderness, amen, his aim was to, 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 uh, devour him. His aim was to ensure that at the end of the day, this man has lost it, just like Adam and Eve did. Amen. But he could not. So we have to be sober and be vigilant because there's a devil who is coming with a temptation to move you. I tell people all the time that temptation don't mean sin. Because the truth be told is that the devil can't move your hands to do anything. Amen. But he can entice you to do something. So Ephesians chapter 6 Verse 11 confirms this. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against what? The wiles of the devil, the schemes of the devil, I mean, the plans of the devil. Because the devil is planning to get you. Amen. And that's a source of temptation, the devil. And therefore, you have to put on the whole armor that he may be able to stand against him. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And we have heard from our pastor, Numerous times where that word resist mean. It means that you're actually putting up a fight. Don't mean you're backing down and 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 and, and trying to be uh run from him. It means that look here, you're standing on what the word of God says. And once you do that, he will leave you for a season. And note I said for a season. The devil, as long as we're in this life, in this flesh, we have to be sober. We have to be vigilant. We have to put on the whole armor of God. We have to resist the devil. Amen. Because it's only for a season. Second temptation comes through the flesh. Uh, Paul said it as he wrote to the church at Rome. He said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, well, it no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Amen. Here it is that the man of God is saying the prophet, the, the apostle, amen, is saying that, look here, he wants to do good, but there is a there is a law in his flesh. There is a law in his body, amen, that is fighting against us. So temptation will come from that very place. You, your, your very feelings and your desires, how you think about things, how you were raised, amen, will want you to say, look here, man, this is how I feel. And that's why we cannot trust our feelings. Amen. We have to be careful that we start to think that how I feel is how I should do it. Amen. Or how it should be done. Amen. Me can't help myself. I saw mistake. Amen. The devil is a lie. The Bible says that your heart is, is wicked, desperately wicked. Amen. And therefore, we can't we trust our own hearts in making certain decisions. What we have to do is trust God in helping us. Amen. Because in me, as in my flesh, dwells no good thing. He goes on to say in James chapter 1, verse 14 to 15, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own loss and enticed. That when loss had conceived, it bring it forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bring it forth death. So the man is tempted when he is pulled away by what? His own, not the devil this time, his own loss and enticed. Amen. Those things that, that, you, that you truly want. Amen. And there's a thing about us. Sometimes if you make up your mind to do something, amen, nobody can stop you from doing it. If you truly make up your mind to accomplish something, you will get it. You know, no matter what it is, you will find a way to deal with it. You'll find a way to get it. If you truly, truly, truly want it. In a similar way, the Bible says every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own loss and enticed. In other words, here it is that he's telling you now the desires are so become so strong because it is really what you truly want. And therefore, the flesh becomes a source of temptation. Praise God. Lastly, the world. It's a whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. Amen. There is a pull in the world. There is a there is a thing. Amen. And, and sometimes we have this, this form of fear of missing out. Sometimes we want to be involved in everything. And we think that as children of God, amen, there are some things that we, we, we feel different, that we feel cute. 
you know, because everybody else is doing it. Amen. Why it is that I have to dress the way I, I have to dress? Why it is that I can't party? Why it is that everybody's going to this party and I cannot go? Amen. Why it is that this and why the why the why? Amen. But guess what? The Bible talk about us having, we have to escape the corruption that is in this world. There is a worldly system. Amen. There's a pull. And there, sometimes, as children of God, it feels different. It feels rough when you're going upstream. I mean, imagine the waters flushing in a particular direction and you're going the opposite direction. That is how the temptation of the world is because everybody in the world is going in a particular way, praise God. But as a child of God, we go the opposite way, praise God. We are we are going in a different direction. We are fighting against the tide. We are fighting against, praise God, the systems, amen, that would want to pull us into a devil's hell. As enticing, as beautiful as it will seem, we understand Praise God that look here. If we look back like Lot's wife, we're going to turn into a pillar of salt. We understand that that world is about to be destroyed. And therefore, as beautiful, as, as pleasurable as it is, praise God, there is a temptation that comes from the world. He says, for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Paul writes to the Galatians, according to the will of God and our Father. So there is a present evil world. He says, love not the world. Not the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And John had to be writing this because he understood, amen, uh, the, 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 the pull that's on the world. I can imagine uh, there's a gentleman who was walking with the Apostle Paul, Demas. And Paul said, Demas uh, left me because he loved this present world. He loved the world. Amen. They, 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 when they start love everything that's around you, you want to be a part of everything that is here. Amen. You have to be very careful because it has a way of pulling you out. And as you look around, I mean, you just might still come to church, but coming to church don't mean that you are saved. I mean, coming to church don't mean that your right standing is where your heart is. And, and, and he says you should not love the world. Not talking about the plants and the trees, but talking about the system of the world. Talking about this this this, this thing, amen, that will want you to, to, to aspire to this and that and what the devil wants. All these pleasurable things that comes with it. So there's a temptation that comes from the world. But there's another temptation that 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 that, that comes from God himself. So when your character is to be tried or tested, that one comes from God. So the Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 2 to 3, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith work in patience. So there are some temptation, there are some testing that will try your faith and make you more patient. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6 to 7 says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heavenly through manifold temptation, that the trial of your faith be more, much more present than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You will see the word temptation again, but in this case, it is to try your character. It is to, it's to test you, to, to make you into pure gold. Romans chapter 3, uh, verse 3 to 5 says, And now, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Also, knowing that tribulation work in patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Amen. And in Job chapter 23, verse 10, But he know the way that I take, that when he had been tried, or when he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So there is a temptation, there is a testing that comes from God, amen. But the aim is not to get you into a place where you have sinned. The aim is to get to a place that when you come out, you are gold. When you come out, you are purged. You are refined. You are made into the person. You are ready for ministry. You are going forth in the power of the Spirit. Now, let's just look at uh, the, 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 the same temptation, as it were, that took Part with Adam and Eve. And then we're going to compare that with what Jesus went through. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. 
You're going to realize that when temptation starts, it's always a challenge on the word of God. That's the first thing, the first red flag. When they start challenging the written word or the spoken word, Amen. When 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 you start challenging these things, and you start when you realize that this voice is saying, "Boy, you don't need to do it this way." No man, this is this. Then 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 you need to stop and take check. Hath God said, "You shall not eat of every tree of the garden." And the woman said unto the servant, "We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden." But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, "He shall not eat of it." Neither shall he touch it, lest he die. We continue. And the serpent said unto the woman, He shall not surely die. For God doth know that the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now note this part. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. We know the rest of the story. As a result of this, humanity was plunged, praise God, into sin. As a result of this, we adapted a nature, amen, that was foreign to us, praise God. From that point in, from that point in time, Man was destined to die. Because what had happened is that sin was introduced. And it came as a result of a temptation. So you notice temptation didn't just come to somebody who was a sinner. But it came to somebody who knew no sin. As a result of yielding to the sin, they were now at a place, amen, where they were separated from God. But hear what John says. As he explained what took place then, he says, any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him. He says, for all that is in the world is the loss of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It's not of the father, but it's of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God, and by the way, the will of God is the word of God, abideth forever. Now, I want us to do a comparison of what took place in the fall in the Garden of Eden versus the victory in the wilderness. So the fall in the garden versus the victory in the wilderness. Now, when we compare the verses, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, and Genesis chapter 3, we note how temptation works. So we're talking about temptation. We know temptation comes from either the devil, it comes from our own desire, it comes from the world, and these are the temptation that is seeking to entice you to do sin, to get you to a place where you are totally separated from God. But we know that testing comes from God, and the aim of the test is to make you into pure gold. When we compare this, this event in Genesis chapter 3, we realize that the devil has not changed his strategy throughout all of human time. To this very day, you're going to realize that every time you sin, it is on one of these levels. As a matter of fact, it normally starts at the first and progressive to the last. A person don't just get up and just start to go away from God. It starts from flesh, loss of the eyes, then the pride of life. And this is the progression that we're going to see. So, for example, in Genesis chapter 3, they talk about the loss of the flesh. Loss of the flesh. If you look back at the verse. It says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree is to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and she did give also to her husband with her, and he did eat. The first thing that happened was that the food, that tree was there. I don't know how long it was there, but all of a sudden, the devil has a way of making what is bad looks good. So the tree now becomes good for food. 
And that's where the flesh comes in, the lust of the flesh. It, 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 it starts to appeal to your flesh. It looks enticing. It looks like something that you would want. Amen. Why it is that I have to, that looks more, that looks better to me than how I presently do my thing. They look like, the world look like it's a happy place. Amen. It looks good. Then there's the loss of the eyes, the light. It, it becomes not all that it, it feels good, but it looks good. The, the light into the eyes. You want this thing. So it will come good for food and a light to the eyes. Then pride of life seems to make one wise. So the devil now progresses the thing as it goes along. One, it's good for food. Two, it becomes a light to your eyes. And three, it appeals to the inner man, make one wise. Number one, you're going to realize that the first one appeals to the outer man, the flesh, food, hunger. The second one appeals to the soul, the light to the eyes. The third one appeals to the spirit, the pride, make one wise. All of these things are happening as a result of the fact that they yield, uh, they listen to the devil. I was telling a friend of mine recently that when it comes down to the devil, don't have a conversation with him. My sister always tell me this. She said, don't have conversations with the devil. The devil has been into every university from the beginning of time to this present time. Some of the, the most brilliant minds in the world, they did it. Brilliant minds, scientists that ex exist in the world are atheists. How do they become atheists? Because the devil knows how to get to those minds. And he uses people like these. The only way you can overcome the devil, you're going to realize what Jesus did. And he used the tool that... And what he was doing, you know, he was demonstrating to us what we need to do. Because the devil, the, the, the devil really was no match for who Jesus is. We know that. We don't, we don't try to compare the devil and Jesus and not like that. But, the, but Jesus knew that we needed to know what we should do so that we can become victorious. Too. So he has given us an example. Amen. Don't entertain him. Use the word. The word of God says this. You speak the word and you move on. Amen. Word of God said, look here. Uh, somebody come to you and say, you, you feel like your heart said, no man, just cuss them out. But you remember the scripture that says, follow peace with all men and holiness. So you follow that and you quote that. Amen. You know, the word of God says, you must do this or you must do that. Amen. Use the word of God because there's a word for every situation and the devil don't like it. So let's just look at the temptation as we try to compare the fall in the garden which we understood that took place. They fell because of the loss of the eye. They fell because the loss of the flesh, firstly, then the loss of the eye and the pride of life. And look what Jesus did. The same things that they failed in, Jesus became victorious over these things to show us as children of God that we too can become victorious. So let's start with the first temptation, the loss of the eye. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. Let's look at that. It says... Then Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness and to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. I would describe earlier what that mean. He was at a point where he felt as if he was about to starve to death. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of man, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Hmm. Now, one of the things was realized when the Bible says, if you are the son of God, let me just clarify that. He was not asking Jesus that like a, if, like a normal if statement. If you are the son of God, like, you're not sure. He knew who Jesus was. A better explanation would have been like, since you are the son of God, since you are a Christian, since you say you are a Christian, this must happen for you. Yeah. And therefore, from that approach is where the devil came. If thou are the son of God, or since you are the son of God, 
command that these stones be made bread. Now, I want us to understand that the devil wants us to use powers selfishly for our own use. In other words, he, what he's trying to do is to get us to a point where we look at things on the physical as more important than that on the spiritual. That's where he wants us to get. You know, there, 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 there is a there is an issue that is in the world, and a, a long life, long debate. Motor monks are theologians and, 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 and atheists and agnostics, and the, the whole issue about evil. And they would question things like if you serve a good God, you know. If you serve a good God, he should be able to provide for you, you know, or you shouldn't be so sick. Or if you serve a good God, why it is that people are dying like this? They go to the hospital and people are, are, are people are dying death. And sometimes you pray and nothing don't happen. And sometimes you, you have the power in your hands, amen, to, to take on that particular thing. Why don't you do that? Hmm. But I want us to understand that sometimes God wants us to trust him to the point that we understand that, look here, if, if we don't get some things in this life on the physical, our trust in God is so much that if it don't happen here, we know that God is going to give us some blessings ahead. So Paul put it this way, the light afflictions which are but for a moment, working for us a far more exceedingly eternal weight of glory. I realize that sometimes a lot of people, they will walk out of the house of the Lord. They will compromise their Christianity because the devil will attack you where you are physically weak. At that place where, oh my God, it seems as if nothing will happen for me. You, 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 you need... You, 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 you are in need of something on a physical level. And it seems as if it's not coming. You know? Um, and, 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 and that is where the devil would, would try to, to interject himself and to say to you, say, look here, you have the power to get this done still, you know. You don't have to do it this way. You don't have to wait on God. You don't need to wait on God. I mean, why wait on God to provide when, you know, you can you can do a little bang, do a little thing here and get it at the physical level. That's where it starts, you know. Um, why it is that you you need to to wait on God where, I mean, nobody enough is to say you go, go buy lotto or you go buy pig tree. Nobody enough to know. I mean, you're trying to satisfy a need. You're trying to turn these, these stones into bread. He understands that you are at a place where you are physically weak. And that's where the devil will attack you the most. He wants to use power selfishly for your own use. Knowing that, look here, at the end of the day, you can obtain some things if you do this. He wanted the Jesus, as it were, to doubt the fact that God could provide for him. And even if God did not provide for him, he wants to doubt the fact that God would have left him in a state to the point where it's it's, it's eternal turn away. He makes the, the situation so big that it seems as if this is forever and ever and ever and ever. But let me remind you of a story, amen, of a rich man and a poor man. The rich man ate every day. He had, the Bible talks about him dressing in purple. But the poor man practically... um. Didn't have anything. He ate from the rich man's table. The poor man had nothing in his life. Dogs licked his sores. No, you would have said, my God, God can provide bread. God can provide healing for somebody like this. Somebody who is in a state of their, in their, that their, their weakest state. And the devil is saying, you don't need to do this, Lazarus. All you need to do, you need to do, probably you need to steal to get it. Probably you need to do this to get it. And that's what gets a lot of us in problems because we do not wait on God. We, we jump ahead 
And then at the end of the day, because we think that we are in need of something, amen, the devil put something before us. But I want us to understand something. God never turns stones into bread. That's not a principle. Billy Cole put it this way. He says, God, do not turn stones into bread. But what God does is that he used the bread that we have to make more bread. I mean, the God will not, because you are hungry, goes against his principle. The principle is this. Whatever word you have, God will multiply that. Amen. Because man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And I'm glad that Jesus was able to use the word of God. Amen. To combat what the enemy comes with. The attack is on the physical. No, we need to get this in our minds, brothers and sisters, that the first temptation that will reach you is on the temptation of, look here, you have a need. Amen. There are some things your child needs to go back to school. Amen. It seems as if things don't work out. But there is a deal. You know, even little things, even little things, we, we, some of us need to repent of. Amen. Uh, we now get the driver's license, so we decide to do a bamboo the way and go buy it. Amen. Or, you know, we, 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 we go to tax office and, and, and we, 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 we're we supposed to do a particular thing, but we, we're under the counter and we do something that we know that is illegal. Amen. Because we have a physical desire. But guess what? The, Jesus put it clear. Jesus look at the temptation of the physical and he said, look here, man shall not live by bread alone. Because the truth be told, all of these things that you will get in the physical will satisfy a need. But he wants us to get the picture that the physical is only temporary what we see the brothers and sisters is only temporary but what is not seen is eternal amen the word of god is by which god spoke this world into being the word of god is what we live by and therefore man should not live at the level of thinking that everything about you is physical the first temptation was on the level of the physical. Amen. And therefore, it's very important that we understand, praise God, when we place God in such a high place, amen, it means then that the word of God will be so prevalent in our lives that irrespective of what we lack, we understand that if we lack it here, we'll get it tomorrow. So Lazarus sat at the, sat at the rich man's, or was, well, got food that fell from the rich man's table. But we understand how God truly operates. Because if you don't get something here, you will get it there. And the truth be told, what you get there will far supersede what you miss here. Amen. We don't have to have the fear of missing out on the physical here. There are some stuff they say, why I can't do this? Why I can't do that? Why? But you need to understand that, look here, all of these things are just temporary things. And if, if it should mean more to you to give them up, as you get closer to God, there are some stuff that you don't even want. You just want him. Because the physical is not so much important to you like the word. Jesus taught us from the first, temptate, first temptation that we do not live on bread alone. We do not live on the physical alone. But every word, in other words, what the word of God says take preeminence in our lives. What the word of God says is more important than the very bread you eat. If it means that we're going to starve today, I, I, I like the fact that Daniel decided that okay, he will not defile himself with the king's meat. I like that story because even though he was out of uh, Jerusalem, even though he was far away from his homeland, he could have chosen to do things that particular way. But he decided, look here, I prefer to stick with what the word of God tells me. Amen. So he decided not to go on the physical in the king's meat. And decided, praise God, at the end of the day, praise God, to eat, eat pulse or whatever it is that they ate. But guess what happened? At the end of the day, we saw the results. One decided to not eat, live by bread alone, not to just satisfy his hunger. You don't do those do things because nobody not seen it. Oh, I'm not at church, so we can just drink a beer. You know, or we can just drink two liquor because, you know, liquor wine for the stomach's sake, you know, and these type of things. And we think it's okay. By the way, uh, one of these days, you probably should look at the whole idea of drinking and liquor and what these things are. Because we get the impression that when Paul said to Timothy that a liquor wine for the stomach's sake, it means that you can't go drink. But we need to understand the Greek and understand what was taking place. It was not fermented. And I, I, I won't even go into that right now. But we do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
How does this relate to us? The devil attacks us when we are physically weak. Amen. The devil seeks to tempt us uh, when we are weak and he understands the power that we have and the resources that we have to us and he wants us to use it selfishly because he wants us to say, okay, let me just put a, put a light, put aside the word of God and just try to, because right now I'm in a dire need. But your true temptation really comes and the true testing and victory comes when you can overcome some of these things even in the state of when you truly, truly need it. When you truly, truly need it. And you know what I'm talking about. When somebody come to you, the, the, the devil knows your need, you know. He know that boy, uh, you have school fee to pay. He know, say, you have bills to pay. He know, say, boy, the light got cut off. Yeah. But if you do a little thing on the side and, and, and you, you, you know, you throw a wire over an electric thing or you do something, then, you know, it will, it will, it will serve a need. So he attack you where you are physically weak. He ensured that Jesus was hungry after 40 days and 40 nights. The only thing he needed was bread. I can strongly believe in my mind, just in hearing the word bread, supposed to make the man, supposed to send the man like, I don't know. I remember years ago when we went on fasting and Pastor Crystal years ago, and we were supposed to eat five crackers a day. And, and persons who have been around Faith Chapel long enough know about the five crackers a day fast. The one where you, 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 you are only allowed to eat five crackers every single day. Do you remember that after a period of time, the crackers taste like chicken? My God, I can tell you, I was young. And I clearly remember being in that at church. And we know you can't wait to go eat your crackers because the crackers taste like chicken. So you can imagine Jesus after 40 days and 40 nights. And the Bible says he was hungered. And I tell you, the man was, so the fact that the devil even said, turn this stone into bread. He had the ability to do it. He had the ability to, to, to choose his physical over the spiritual. But there's a lesson in that too. Don't listen to the devil. Even if it's so good. Even if it's a good option, don't choose it. If the devil say A, choose B. Go better yet. If the devil say A, choose Z. Because they want to go as far to the other side to what the devil has to say. The devil is a wicked person. Yeah, and, and he will do anything to ensure that you go against the word of God. So we'll try to get us focused on our own needs and wants instead of God's plan. And that's particularly what he wants to do. For him to emphasize his own desires. What you want. What is important to me over truly what the word of God wants us to have. But Jesus taught us. That you, you can overcome on the physical. That's what Jesus taught us. He himself was at a state of hunger. He himself was at a place where is the greatest need physically was food. The devil knew this. And sometimes when we when you have that great need, expect the devil to come because it can give you options. When you have a need, there are options. When you have a need. There are options. Let me say it again. When you have your great need, options will come. But guess what? When you choose the word of God, and that's why I said earlier, when you, you can only overcome temptations, when the word of God is truly cemented inside of you, where what spills out from you is the word. That's the only time when the word of God becomes what, what is truly, truly important. That's why Jesus said, uh, in what I tell you, you have to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. All different levels. All your soul, your mind, your strength, which is the physical, everything. Every area of you must love God. Love God to the point where you choose him over these other things. Now look at the second temptation, the loss of the eye. It goes like this. It says, then the devil take it him up into a holy city and set it him on a pinnacle of the temple. And said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now what do we learn from this? The devil wants us to test God. Now, let me make a point here. You see, the devil can't 
car couldn't get Jesus on the physical to doubt God or to, to go contrary to what God says. So he tempted him and Jesus used the word. Now here it is that the devil comes with the other side and he also uses the word. Now that's a very important point. If the devil can get you to doubt God, he will behave in such a way that it creates a misrepresented doubt. In or better yet, in more if we act in a way that is contrary to what the word of God says by misrepresenting what the word of God says. So it gives you the impression that you are acting on the word, but in truth be told, you are acting on a misguided version of the word. Satan also tried to proceed you to doubt God, but he dis disguised the motivation of doubt as an expression of fear. That yeah, that 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 that's his particular what I'm saying. He wants us to un to get the word in such a way that we are misguided by what truly the word of God says. So now he's no not attacking you on the level of the physical. He has no moved to the level of the soul, where is now wisdom is going to be the ultimate thing in terms of how you operate. In other words. The devil will come with the very word of God that you preach and use it in such a way that it is a, it is not the full story. In other words, the devil will try to put the word of God in such a way that it is disguided as an act of faith. He wants to put you in a place of danger and to disguise this dangerous place as an act of faith. He wants us to test God and to say, God, your word says this. When the truth be told, God was not the one who led you there. Can I tell you something? We need to understand how God operates now. Paul wanted to go and preach in a particular place. But the Bible said the Holy Ghost stopped him from going that particular place and sent him somewhere else. It was later on before he was able to go to Asia, I think it was. He got the Macedonia cry. In other words, he would say, boy, but the man's desire, the word of God is for mission and, and to do the work of God and to do this. But at the end of the day, if God don't send you, you can't go. You can't just get up and say, okay, the word of God says this and therefore I'm going to move. You, you need the whole truth. You need to put things together to ensure that what you speak is in alignment and not contradictory. He leads me through the valley of the shadow of death for his name's sake. No, it is God who is leading. Not me just get up on the side and I go walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The devil will put you in a place of danger and say, boy, the word of God will protect you. But that's not true. Amen. He wants us to use part truth. He might say, okay. Let me tell you, let me make a point to you here. You can prove anything with the Bible if you read it like the devil read it. You can prove anything from the Bible if you read it the way the devil read it. So here it is that the devil was quoting to him the psalm. I said, look here, you bring him to a particular place. I say, show yourself down, man. Don't, don't, don't. The Bible say, God, the angel of the Lord, I will catch you if you dash your foot against a stone. So just throw yourself down, putting him in a place of danger and then using the word of God to say it will protect you. Brethren, they that are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You cannot get up and decide that you're going to do something impractical. Amen. Decide that, look here, me go, me go just, me just have go down in a, um, this particular place, go do this and God never lead you there. You have to balance the thing. There must be a balance to how the thing work. So what we learn is that the, we, the devil's tactics always involve distorting our understanding of faith and testing God. Why do you think he has all false religions out there? Because somebody got up and said, oh, I got a revelation. 
And all of a sudden, it is a misguided version of what the word of God says. So the devil will try to make us doubt God's promises or manipulate our, 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 uh, us into the presumptuous action under the guise of faith. And guess what? These things ultimately lead us away from the true trust and obedience to God. We have to be very careful that when we do things, amen, we don't do things stupidly and mess up ourselves. I can give you some practical examples of this. Amen. You might have a, a financial temptation where the devil might tempt someone who is struggling financially to doubt God's provision by encouraging them to take dishonest or unethical shortcuts to gain wealth quickly. And say, boy, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to have financial security in return. That's a lie. Or you might be facing a health crisis and the devil tempted someone to doubt God's healing promise by leading them to pursue unproven harmful treatments. Or tell him, say, look here, uh, look here, you, you, you know, there, there might be a room to do this, you know. Or you might have some relationship struggle where you say, boy, things not going to go their house, but, you know, there's somebody there, so they love me enough and they will do this and do that for me. That's how the devil operates. He, he gives you a misguided version of scripture. Put you in a place of danger and say, if you do this, God is going to do that. My brethren, I like how Jesus responded to him. Jesus says, Jesus brings some clarity by revealing what truth is. He said, it is also written. No, he said, every time the devil comes to you and say, it is written, let him understand, balance the thing and say, it is also written. Because that's where the, the true victory comes in. That's why you have to have the word of God. And the devil will twist the word. I saw something on somebody's status and they were asking me if it's true that the devil cannot read. The devil can read better than you and me. And know languages, all of them, Greek, Hebrew, Spanish, whatever it is. He knows it. But guess what? What is important for us is that when the devil comes and says it is written, because that's what will happen. The devil will tell you that it is written. But guess what? You need not one side. You need the full thing. You have to interpret scriptures in the in the in the gamut of the entire Bible, in the in the context of the entire scripture. You can't just read one verse and decide that so you understand and, and and pull it out of its context and build something around. Why do you think false doctrines come in? Why do you think so much people are being led astray? Why do you think wide is the way that leads to destruction? Because many people are following what the devil says. It is written. But what, what we need for also balance it out with scripture and say it is also written. So if we read Matthew 28, verse 19, where it says it is written. Go you therefore teach all nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. Because it is also written that whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we understand by the also written, we balance out Matthew 20, verse 9. And it's a basic example. So we understand why it is important that scriptures must speak together. And Jesus brought that example to us. I want somebody to, to make sure and make note of this. When the devil comes to you and says, it is written, let him understand that it is also written. Balance the equation. And run the devil. So in each of these examples, the devil, the devil is trying to, to exploit uh, uh, vulnerabilities and, and distort our, our understanding of God's promises. He wants us to, 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 to be in a place of, of unfaithfulness. And want us to act presumptuously and in ways that will ultimately separate us from God's will and purpose for our lives. And let me give you an example. We know it is good, not good for the man to be alone. We know that it is good for uh, marriage is honorable, the Bible says, and the bed undefiled. We know all of these things. I remember years ago, and two stories. And I don't remember if I told it last week, but I'll say it again. Two different instances, two different persons came and they decided that, look here, they want to get married. And they went to the pastor and the pastor said, boy, look here. For a couple of reasons. One, the person who they wanted to get married to was unsaved. And the pastor said, well, there's no way I can give you the go ahead for this. Why it contradicts scripture. So while it is good to get married, while it's not good for the man to be alone, while, but there are some principles that we're not going to defile. There are some principles that we're not going to go contrary to. 
I mean, the word of God teaches something, we'll work with that. Two can walk together except they be agreed. Be not equally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship are, and we know the, the whole stories in relation to this. Now, at the moment, things feel good and nice, and you jump towards that. You say, well, pastor, I understand how we feel. You know, God, you know, understand what is happening. You tell me so we can do this thing. We can get married and get to so find somebody. Or better yet, me go to me find somebody and save. Me, we save them. Me, we ensure that at the end of the day. Because that's what the devil puts to. He always distorts it to the point where he say, okay, they're not saved knowing about me. We can get them saved. I can tell you this. On the two instances that I know of, the, the marriages never work out. In one of the instances, the person, the, one of the persons is dead. In another other instance, the other person practically, in my opinion, I think the person probably half mad. Because pastor can't dictate them life and tell them what to do. Brethren, when the enemy impose something on you, let it be known, use the word of God. That it is also written. Balance it out. Balance out the equation. And ensure that you're moving in relation to what the word of God tells us to do. Temptation number three, the pride of life. Let's look at this one. It says, again, the devil taking him up into an exceeding high mountain. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And Satan to him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Now, well, what the devil is doing here is that we. This is the third level of temptation that the devil comes with. A lot of people become servants to the enemy because when he takes us to that high mountain, that high position, that place where, you know, everybody aspires to be, and he offers you all of this, all the, the worldly glory and the, the success and all of these things. And he's telling you that you can get this. All you need to do is compromise your values and your allegiance to God. Because that's what normally happens. You know, you have to do a little compromise here and there. You know, you have to get involved in a little this and a little that. The lesson teaches us that we have to be careful of the glory and that and uh, that, that that the compromise that will come with the glory. Let me put it that way. We have to be we have to stay cautious of being drawn towards worldly success and, and to the point where it makes our obedience to God not where it's supposed to be. Our obedience to God must be our top priority rather than chasing after earthly accomplishments. And what we see happening is it's as if nothing is wrong. Nothing is wrong with getting certain things in this life. But we need to understand that the devil wants us that he wants us to reach that place where, 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 where the, the, the worldly things, the worldly success becomes our priority. And therefore the scripture here in Matthew 5, Matthew 4, 8 to 11 is remind us that we must be weary of the alluring of worldly success and to prioritize our obedience to God's will over the pursuit of earthly achievements. Amen. In other words, the higher the danger of compromise God's ways, but better yet, the higher we climb, the more easy it is for us to compromise God's ways. And we have to do this because sometimes when people get high, they start to uh they start to gain certain recognition and certain things that they wouldn't get normally when they're at the low level. But it comes with a cost. It comes with a cost, it comes with a testing of 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 
of a lot of the gifts that you get might not be in alignment with God's will and God's value. The things that 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 might be given to you at the end of the day might pull you out of the house of God. So in Matthew 4, 8, 11, we learn the importance of guarding against the temptation to compromise our values and pursue worldly success. You know, you know, it's time I've seen it where people come to the house of God and they have nothing. But the moment God moves them up and, and, and the true test, and this applies across the board, you know, because even in the house of God, when God moves us up with great power comes great responsibility. As God moves you from place to place, we have to be cognizant that as we get to that high mountain and we are seeing everything, we have to make sure that, look, irrespective of what position we have, we are not willing, praise God, to give up our salvation like that. We must stay steadfast in our commitment to God's ways, even at, the, at, at whatever comes. Some of us, in order for us to get the position, we have to do this, or you have to sleep with that person, or you have to do that, you know? Or you, And you realize that at the end of the day, these things value nothing. Let me tell you how I know it value nothing. Look at how the devil did with Jesus when he brought him up into the high mountain. The Bible said, and he showed it him in just a moment or a quick glimpse. In a quick moment, quick succession, everything just flashed before him. In other words, it's supposed to go so fast, your mind makes it seem like everything is good. It looks like it has some worth or some value. You know, as people leave the house of the Lord and they, they leave the house of God for some things that they thought had great value to them. But later on, they learn that all of these sparkling things that they that they thought was sparkling was practically just is what was was really worthless. But the devil don't make it look too long. It's a quick succession. So everything look good. You know, as people leave the house of the Lord, brethren, and they want to come back, but they, 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 the, the, the grip is, they're, they're so imprisoned. Because let me tell you something about what happens at this level. When we talk about the level of the physical, the level of the soul, now we're talking about the level of the spirit. At the level of the spirit, it becomes worship. I said to worship is to serve and to serve is to worship. In other words, it becomes when you reach that level where he brings you up into a high mountains and he shows you the things of the world. What simply happens is that you have become so tied to it that you feel like this is what life is. You can't give it up again. It becomes almost something that you worship. And that's why God, that's why Jesus had to just dismiss him right off the bat there. He responded so sharp that look here, it was it's not like the other two. He just said, Look here, man, get thee behind me, Satan. But he did use the word, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God. Notice you now, he brought him up into a mountain, show him all the things. I said, All of these things I will give you if you bow down and worship me. There are some things that you will get if you decide to compromise. There are some things you will get that if you decide to, 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 and we see it in, we talk about all the time in the music industry where people gain so much fame and people gain all of this. And, and, and at the end of the day, they want to come out and they sing about it that they want and they have been held captive because to worship is to serve and to serve is to worship. But as child of God, we need to understand that we can overcome temptation by saying, Satan, get thee behind me. What appears solid and dependable and significant. But, and, and that this happened at a quick moment. It seems solid. It seems like, say, boy, if I get this thing, I'm like, all right. Let me get that. Let me get the husband. Let me get that. You know, most people leave the house of the Lord and say, boy, they want the man and they want the woman. And as a, as a quick glimpse, everything looks perfect. The devil make it look so nice and pretty. And it turns out to be cobweb. It turns out to be dung. It turns out to be something that they that, that they eventually hate. It reminds me of the story of, of when um David's son raped Tamar. 
desired the woman so much. But when he got what he wanted, the Bible said, in he hate her. That's what the devil going to do. You're going to reach a point where you're so depressed and hurt. But God has taught us that, look here, when he brings you into the high mountain and show you everything, I'm not going to say, say, bow down and worship me, you know. But you will know that you're worshiping because you're elite. And worshiping don't necessarily mean you bow down and you But worship can mean all of a sudden church is not important anymore. The job is. All of a sudden, everything about work, work becomes your first priority. And anything that you put before God is your God. If you mean, say, you love work so much because you're, you're working big money now, you have got big position. And I'm not talking about working a one-off weekend. And I, I, where I work, it requires stuff like that. I'm talking about to the point where it becomes your first priority. You know, some people spend, give all their energy and their time to to the work and to get this done and to get that done for the boss and to get that done and in the house of God they do nothing but you still expect that when they go to heaven God is going to say well done good and faithful servant who are you serving truly God brought you up and God elevated you and God gave you positions in the office and instead of using some of these things to enhance the kingdom of God amen we, 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 we spend all our hours and our time and I don't I, God forgive me I'm not cursing anybody what I'm saying brothers and sisters is that we have to uh, check ourselves because there's some temptation that affect the physical there's some temptation that affect the soul but there's some temptation that affect the spirit and when it start get to a point where these things are affect your spirit man you need to say get thee behind me Satan for it is written God alone will get worship him alone will serve. I understand if it means that you have to give up some things for God. God will be a debtor to no man. Because anything you give up for God, God will give you that tenfold. And even if you don't get it in this life, you'll get it back then. Some things, if you realize, it's messy with your Christianity. I was telling somebody recently that that is why for me, even to get, if my profession affects my Christianity, me not doing it. If it means I have to compromise on who I am as a Christian. If it means that people have a question, I say, boy, oh, you're a Christian and you do that. Oh, you're a Christian and you accept that. That's double standard for me. My people have to find something. It's better work in our little office. I understand everything, but God, God have to provide. Jesus' response was very swift. I'm saying, Satan, get thee behind me, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. Again, I say this again, to worship is to serve, and to serve is to worship. Tonight I will close with this, by saying it's important to note that this is in this account, as our Lord faces temptation on the levels of the physical, the soul, and the spirit, at every point in time, what was the most important thing in his life? Is what the word of God says. When I check the word of God, the Bible says, Come up from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. If what I'm doing is causing too much of mingling and whatever the case is, then me say I, 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 I'm compromising on one of these levels. If it means say me not getting something on the physical, and it means that me have to do something contrary to the word of God, it means I have compromised on the physical or the soul or the spirit. If it means that we have to make some decisions that, that would put my life in danger, amen, and at the end of the day, I'm testing God to see how, how strong God is. <laughs> and, you're, and you're not using the word of God and using wisdom. Like I said, we talk about using wisdom. It applies, brethren. Use the word of God. If it means that you can compromise on the level of the spirit where these things now become your God, if you can, if you spend 10 hours at work and only pray for half an hour, then something is amiss. You don't have to argue or debate. What you use is the word of God as your refuge. Jesus never argued with the devil. But he relied completely on what God had said. As children of God, there is victory for us. Jesus overcame. Jesus showed us how we can overcome on the physical, at the level of the soul, at the level of the spirit. There are consequences for sin that we spoke about last week. 
But Jesus tell us that we can become victorious so we don't have to even reach there. So we can become victorious over the physical. If you don't have, trust God. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which shall not be removed, but abide forever. God promises to supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Not all your wants, because there are some things that God will not give you. There are some things that you might want. I might say, God, why them get it and why them don't get it? Or why them, some people in the church get it and me don't have it? But God knows each and every one of us. And God knows what is best for me, the songwriter says, even though I cannot see it. On the physical, God, I'm trusting that you will supply all my needs according to you, which is in glory. In relation to the soul, I'm not going to use pride and say, okay, I'm going to test God, but I'm going to move according to what the word of God says. When God says move, me move. When God says settle, we settle. Then trust God for that. And the level of the spirit, amen, anything where God, if God lifts me to a high mountain and if, if anywhere I go in life, if God moves me from the position of where I'm at to a more senior position, shoot me to let me just say this quickly. If you want to test somebody's character, give them power. Let's say it again. If you want to truly test somebody's character, I know of situations where persons have been working so well in the house of God, but as soon as God moved them to another level, it's a total different person. We see to the case of Saul, Saul was a humble man, hide among the stocks, never want to be recognized. But when he became king, amen, it was it, 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 it get to his head. As he move higher, it's the time for you to walk lower. As you move higher, walk lower. God teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. God teach us to learn what the word of God says. Teach us to learn from you. If we have suffering, Jesus learned obedience from the things he suffered. So on the physical, if we have issues, but he's working for our good. And therefore, every temptation that came in Matthew chapter 4, before Jesus went out in the power of the Spirit to do miraculous things he had to overcome. And God is telling us, just like he overcome, you can overcome. He became an overcomer, an example, the man that we can be like. So we don't have to talk about even just the consequence of sin because we know that when the devil appears for his season, we're going to be victorious. If we're hungry, we know that the word of God, the word of God will keep us. If it's at a certain level, we're not going to put ourselves in danger. If we move up to a certain level, we're not going to test God. Amen. We're not going to worship no other God. And if anything is want to take that place, we prefer to step back. Daniel, the three Hebrews, is a good example of what it means to be in a system, but not of the system. To be in the world, but not of the world. Because even though they said, bow down and worship his image, three Hebrews decide we will not do that. And even though they said, don't pray, but to no other person, Daniel decides, I'm going to turn my face to the east and pray. Because guess what? What is priority is not where I'm at in this life. It's one God I serve. And in good times, I went praise him. And in bad times, I went praise him. And when things go bad, I went praise him. When things go good, I went praise him. Because the word of God is him must serve. And he's going to take care of me. I'm going to stop here. God bless you tonight. I pray God that we have learned something. And I pray God that we'll try to apply some of these things to our lives. God bless you. Let us close tonight in prayer. Great God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were an example for us. God, your word was spoken tonight. I pray right now, God, in the name of Jesus, that you will help us, Lord Jesus, to trust you, to trust in your words, and to look to you, who is the God of heaven. Thank you one more time as we look to you with the author and the finish of our faith. In Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. In Jesus' name.